Okay, so, um, hi, how are you to this afternoon? My name is Caroline Peterson, and I'm with the Supportive Care uh, Program at Joan Cornell Cancer Center at Pennsylvania Hospital, which is part of Penn Medicine. I'm really happy to be here today, and I uh, appreciate everyone's interest in learning more about integrative medicine, um, supportive care, and um, the part of treatment unrelated to what the oncologists do. So I am going to present some artwork that was made in a program, mindfulness-based art therapy program that I'm going to tell you about that we've been doing at Pennsylvania Hospital. And that program called Walkabout was originally funded through the Live Strong program at the Abramson Cancer Center. It continues at Joan Carnell, and if you'd like a flyer for that today before you go, patients who receive care at Penn Medicine at, Penn, at the Abramson Cancer Center um, may be able to participate based on how many places they're left after we serve our patients at Penn, Pennsylvania Hospital at Joan Carnell Cancer Center. So if you're interested in this program after today, please take a flyer and my number's on it and you can call. So uh, the artwork presented in this uh, presentation, uh, the persons who made it have signed consents to have their work shared, shown with their permission. So William James is the father of American psychology and he did some incredible lectures at Harvard where he uh, taught and wrote and also at Johns, Johns Hopkins University associated with the hospital in Baltimore. And this program that I'm telling you about includes mindfulness, uh, which is, a, is related to attention and uh, attention to the awareness of your direct experience. So William James started writing about consciousness and the relationship between the mind and body in the 19th century. And he said that no conscious event can occur without some parallel event occurring in the nervous system on which the conscious event um, depends. And so it's really important to think about this because we so highly prize our cognitive abilities and there, it makes us human beings and that, you know, we are homo sapiens, we know we know. Uh, importantly though, our nervous system has a lot to say about our experience. And William James wondered about the quality of attention and the idea if people could learn to bring attention to their experience, they might be able to do better at calming themselves and self-regulation and not be so prone to the body, how the nervous system expresses itself and then informs thinking. So mindfulness-based stress reduction, that, that challenge that he offered in the um, 1890s, um, essentially has been answered uh, by the development of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program in New England by John Kabat-Zinn in the late 1979, so a century later. So the, um, the skills um, that can be developed with attention to help us calm the mind and body were developed as a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. Uh, this is kind of a technical presentation to begin, and then I'm going to move into showing you some of the art uh, creations, in this case collage, that were made as part of a mindfulness-based program, a mindfulness-based art therapy program, and an art therapist and an MBSR teacher. So it's really interesting because we all know about wandering mind. Perhaps you've been in a car or um, you sat in an office waiting and you've lost your attention to your thoughts and you've had a stream of thinking. Um, and so we know about wandering mind. Often when we're under distress, we tend to visit the same place over and over again. It can become rumination. We kind of wander into thinking about our well-being. If we have a life-threatening illness, we may be inclined to visit that place quite a bit. How am I gonna do? Am I gonna get better? What's going to happen for me? And what researchers have done is look at the brains of people who meditate, who do mindfulness meditation, and compare them to people who don't. And so what they're saying is when you don't have something you're directing your attention to and you just wander off, that's called stimulus-independent thought, 
Um, your con that's your default state. You might think of the computer screen that's the default when you're not using it. And what happens is, is that the people that meditate, because they've been trained to use their attention skillfully to support their well-being, um, what they see is that in their brains, a lot more places light up. And um, in the non-meditators, there tends to be a trend towards visiting the same places over and over in the brain. And so what they're suggesting is that our habitual ways of thinking and the habitual places we hang out, you know, repeatedly, um, especially if we're under distress, or we have distress, or we're uh, facing a challenging medical Ill illness, that um, through mindfulness training, we have the opportunity to actually light up more areas of the brain and be more engaged in daily life. So they're suggesting with this study that this habitual thinking that we can sometimes do actually um, creates a, um, a wall for us and we're not able to be as present-centered and self-reflective as might serve us. So mindfulness-based art therapy, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, is a combination of mindfulness-based stress reduction and art therapy. I want to talk about someone whose work I really like. Um, he's also at Harvard. His name is Robert Keegan. He, um, you may remember Piaget, who uh, wrote a lot in this century, in the last century, in the <laughs> um, in the mid part of the last century, about and earlier about learning and children's learning processes, cognitive development, and this man is also looking at that. And he talks about making meaning, and I think this is so important for us as human beings, and that's what he talks about, and particularly important if we have a diagnosis of an illness that's very challenging for us and maybe life-threatening. So he says the activity of being a person is the activity of meaning-making, and um, human being is the composing of meaning. And particularly, I think it's important to note that he says that Meaning in its origin is both, it's a physical activity which is related to touch and sight and the sensory domains like hearing and such, but it's a social activity that we make meaning in relationship with others. And, um, and it's a survival activity in, in making meaning we live. And there can't be really any more, I think, helpful activity as we face the challenges of life is to keep touching base and staying close to how we can make meaning out of our experience. Mindfulness practices that include art therapy are particularly value for the, valuable for this because with art therapy practices, we're actually grasping art tools and we're playing into understanding our experience and evoking meaning. So um, here's a picture. These are two collages made by someone in our walkabout program. This is a, a picture was made by a caregiver, a, a, a man in his mid-50s who was in the program of his wife. And in our walkabout, we uh, walk outside actually using digital photography and I print those pictures um, for the participants and then they use them to make collages, which is about kind of making meaning out of taking things apart and putting them back together. You can see some of the photographs on either side of this that he's used. And some maybe important words that he's found out on the street uh, related to uh, his fears and concerns, indicating caution. And uh, images too, including straw and um, hair from a wig. And uh, in doing this, I think he wondered about this beautiful red flower at the top on the right. Um, and then, because it was so different than the rest, and I think that he described and said that it, that was the right ending for these two pictures. Kind of top these sharp edges and these things that were broken back apart that were put together with this flower. You might think of this as a way to build meaning and to have the experience non-verbally, and I'll talk about that. I don't mean um, this to be too complicated, this table, but this is a table that reflects a theory of art therapy and the thing is that when we use art materials, you know, we're so used to talking about our experience that we have these ways we speak of it that tend to be habitual again, just like the, the default mode of thinking. 
And the beautiful thing about art making and creativity is, one, it's a physical activity, so that's really important. And it gives us the opportunity for new ways of considering how we want to talk about our experience, because we're using pictures first. And this is from a colleague of mine, Linda Chapman, who works at San Francisco General Hospital with children who have trauma, uh, who are young and up until their teens. And her theory, um, to some extent, talks about um, what she does is she goes into a hospital room and, uh, to see a child with post-traumatic stress disorder. And we know that individuals diagnosed with cancer, there are reports that they have some, can have some subsyndromal PTSD symptoms related to disturbing recollections and avoidant behaviors. So um, what she does is she asks people to make a scribble and then she'll ask the children what brings you here, and they make a picture narrative of their experience. She doesn't ask them to talk about their experience. She asks them to use line, shape, and color, and simple colored pencils to express and tell their story first. So that's thought about generally to be more on the right side of the brain, where negative affect and negative mood may be more predominant, and we can think of language kind of being on the left. Now, that's a very general statement because we, we hold our experience in mental representations of images and we have language as well on both sides of the brain. But uh, what happens is that by making the pictures first, the children are able to process their experience through their sensory motor system in their bodies. You see over here, there's um, a look at this being sensory and then related to mood and perception and then cognitive, so actually what she has them doing is moving from where the trauma is held in the mammalian part of the brain, maybe the limbic system, and get to language, which we might think of as being um, executed more from the prefrontal cortex. So she's actually done a study with children and there's been a reduction of uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms um, based on her intervention, which is a beautiful study. She did the study at Oakland Hospital. So there's good reason to think about art therapy for healing, because it gets us into our bodies and allows us to actually um, kind of play into understanding, to go back to kind of my more primary forms of our nervous system, where we're really holding our experience of illness, our fears and anxieties, and actually process them first with images and then with words. Uh, there are commonalities of form in art therapy and mindfulness. I've been a particularly, um, I guess, an originator of this form of mindfulness-based stress reduction that includes art therapy and this form of art therapy that includes mindfulness. And I'll sh show you some research I've done with that. But um, in art therapy particularly works with imagery because we're not giving the same speech about how we feel, that our defenses are a little bit decreased. And the beautiful thing is when we make pictures, they're outside of us. We're putting what's inside out, and then we're able to see it and be more objective about it. So we move the feeling inside the body onto the paper, and we take what is an inner subjective experience and make it into an object that we can observe and discuss. And that's one way the language um, improves. It is also a cre creative and physical um, participation both in mindfulness meditation practices and uh, in art therapy. And I would say that I'm remembering to mention that um, Abraham Maslow, who developed the hierarchy of needs system that said safety first, you may have heard about that, you know, safety, shelter, food, and such. He was the father of humanistic psychology. Um, art therapy is very much related to creativity, and Maslow at the end of his life said that creativity is related to health itself, um, that and everyone is inherently creative. So the basic MBSR program um, designed by John Kabat-Zinn um, is eight weeks. There are many variations of that, and um, there are four-week programs. I do one at Pennsylvania Hospital, and here at Penn Medicine, um, Gabriel Rocco will be leading a mindfulness program of four weeks, four sessions, for persons with cancer. So this is a particularly wonderful opportunity that there'll be a program for persons with cancer um, um, led by Gabriel, and that starts May 16th, and you can find out more about that by going on pennmedicine.org.
backslash mindfulness. So the program that is taught here um, is uh, that Michael, Dr. Michael Bame developed is very akin to the program that John Cabot then developed at um, the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and I trained it with John to teach MBSR. It includes a number of formal practices, um, sorry, let me go back, um, including body scan meditation, sitting meditation, which is an extended awareness of breathing practice, and then includes uh, a number of variations on that. It includes gentle stretching or yoga, some walking meditation, and a practice I hope we could do today, loving kindness meditation practice. There's also informal practice in daily life, and the curriculum program, the standard program, is eight weeks, but in four weeks you can accomplish a wonderful introduction and a beginning practice. And um, so researchers in mindfulness speak of mindfulness as being able to cultivate receptive attention to the awareness of events and experience. John Kabat-Zinn um, said it was a systematic method to pay attention on purpose in the present moment. This skills training and mindfulness are very much oriented towards being fully engaged in our lives from moment to moment and in daily life, and doing so with a great deal of kindness and curiosity. And it's really a way to learn to step out of the past and um, actually not jump into the future. Um, let go of thinking about the past, let go of thinking about the future towards living fully and saying, what's happening for me now? What's here now for me? Of course, that could be some thinking about the past or the future, and then that can be observed objectively as thinking. It's important, I think, as part of the mindfulness training to start to understand that thinking can push us around a bit, and the, the truth is that we're not our thoughts. Thoughts happen. We have a lot of discursive thinking that we bring attention to that we don't have to use energy for. And we can choose what kinds of thinking we want to align ourselves with. And particularly with a diagnosis of cancer, I'm not in any way suggesting that the arising of thinking that is related to fear or worry um, should be suppressed in any way, and that all thinking should be positive because um, we can get put on the spot with that one. But that we're awake and aware of what happens in our bodies, body sensation, thoughts, and feelings, and from moment to moment, and we start to learn how that's always changing. Uh, we're kind of in the stream of those experiences. So mindfulness training helps us elicit deep relaxation, present moment awareness of the body and mind. And we learn to actually be less automatic in our reaction, less automatically reactive to things, uh, which we often do when we're under stress, and be able to see the choice points. You really can see when we pause and breathe and are more mindful, the choice points for us in any interaction, whether that's with another person, or the reception of a medication that is causing us side effects, pain in the body, um, so mindfulness, mindful attention from moment to moment allows us to be much more skillful in negotiating our direct experience, particularly when it's challenging for us. Uh, when we're challenged, we can have habits of reactivity, and then, of course, that increases the challenge because we get tight and constricted, and um, we're more discomforted, and then the opportunities for choosing what will work for us in the moment dissipate with that tightness and that reactivity. So mindfulness training allows us to actually be more spacious, literally in our bodies, in our physical bodies, and as a result, more spacious of mind, so that um, we can create for ourselves the maximum amount of comfort that's available to us. And that can be really wonderful to be able, in a, a challenging moment, whether it's you're having mental, physical, or emotional pain, to pause and, um, and be able to calm one yourself. Um, and again, it's not about suppressing the arising of difficulty, uh, but shifting into a more um, relaxed state, as relaxed as is available to you, so that you can negotiate the terrain with more skillfulness. So 
Importantly in the curriculum, and we use these a lot in the walkabout program, and I think they're really important, are the attitudinal foundations of mindfulness. And those are related to non-judging patients. Um, beginner's mind, you know, encouraging ourselves to be awake to life and filled with that kind of curiosity and wonder that children have. Trust, trust really related to self-reliance and non-striving, you know, it's an amazing thing, the amount of pressure we put on ourselves to be good, <laughs> to be good at things, to be good people, and um, under stress, that pressure that we put on ourselves can increase. And I love this factor of the skills training and mindfulness, that we actually can step back and we can pause and we can sit with not needing to get anywhere or get anything in the moment. And we can give ourselves a break and have a time out. And mindfulness training really helps us understand that at any point of the day, we have the choice to just pause and breathe, refresh ourselves, and, um, and really ask ourselves the question, you know, what do I want to choose to do now? You know, maybe it's a conversation that's stressful and you're not ready to have it. You know, maybe that you want to say, can I have this conversation another day? Um, so it's really about slowing down and getting into a more natural rhythm and um, be talking about how we're hardwired for that. In mindfulness, we also um, uh, train people to work with um, the triangle of awareness. So the way we experience the world and stimulus from inside the body and out is related to uh, body sensations, um, and that's related to the sense gateways, what touches eye, ear, nose, skin, uh, taste on the tongue, thoughts, and that could be futurizing, uh, that could be remembering, fantasizing, list making, rehearsing, um, and particularly the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. We have a lot of habits of how we define ourselves and the stories we tell ourselves about who we are. And starting to look at those stories and realize that they're just stories and they can be habitual and maybe that's not who we are, you know, or maybe, you know, there are other ways we could think about talking to ourselves because sometimes uh, when we're under stress, we can really give ourselves a hard time. And maybe you know that experience that you, you know, we can, sometimes we can be the ones that are kicking ourselves around the block. And um, the other thing that's good to be aware of is when we're feeling pleasantness or unpleasantness, uh, and mindfulness training helps us do that, we can start to notice when we turn away from things we don't like and turn towards things we like and what those experiences are like. We also can notice if we're holding awfully tight to the things that we want and that we're pushing away very constrictedly from the things we don't want because we know as human beings we often get what we don't want and often we don't get what we want. So how do we negotiate that terrain? And mindfulness helps with that as well. Shauna Shapiro um, is a researcher in mindfulness. I'm sorry the credit is not here on the slide, but she worked for a while when she was a uh, post. Uh, what she was getting, I think she wrote this, or worked with Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona on this conception of self-regulation about the role of attention in health. And so mindfulness is very much about attention. And why is attention important? Well, so William James knew long ago how important it was. Um, but attention, when we bring attention, we stay connected. And when we stay connected, it helps us regulate in the mind and body. So that's psychophysiological self-regulation, and we're hardwired to do that, and I'm gonna talk about that. And then when we are more in balance, then we have a sense of order and ease. And mind mindfulness skills training with attention can help us take maybe a confusing situation or a challenging situation and actually stay connected to ourselves in the midst of it to find our way with more ease. And wouldn't that be great to be able to do more of that? It's very helpful. So I wanted to speak a little bit and I guess I need a time check. 
And that would be great if someone could tell me the time. Um, I'm sorry, I neglected to wear my... Great, this is perfect then. So a little bit about physiological um, and psychological self-regulation, which, um, so the physiolog physiological self-regulation, and this work is by Willoughby Britton. She's at um, Brown University now as a PhD. She has a research center there in mindfulness. She was my colleague in my tr advanced training group at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And you can go online and uh, see her work through a TED Talk at Brown if you're a person that likes the TED Talks on the internet. But her name's Willoughby, W-I-L-L-O-U-G-H-B-Y, Britton, B-R-I-T-T-O-N, and this is her work I'm presenting. And it's simply um, to begin uh, looking at the autonomic nervous system, which is the gateway for how we receive stimulus in the body. And we're hardwired for, um, in our mammalian brain for a sympathetic response, fight, flight. So that's the gazelle running across the Serengeti plain from the lion. It bulks up in the body and is able to go fast and um, like Superman, jump high buildings with a single bound, right? But we're also hardwired for the parasympathetic response in the nervous system. And that's the rest and repair system. And it's where we're more likely, perhaps, to align ourselves with chosen responses rather than automatic ones. So here's an image from the Walkabout program at Joan Carnell Cancer Center and a collage and drawing. And I thought it was a great representation of that parasympath that sympathetic response, that fight flight with the um, you know, dinosaur on the left. And then the Buddha and the flowers, and uh, by the way, a mindfulness-based stress reduction is a medical, medical intervention. It's not uh, a religious program. Um, but uh, here we have two sides of the picture of our nervous system. And um, I think well, well, beautifully represented. So what I want to say about sympathetic activation, besides the fact that you know, we do have, when we are aroused and we feel threatened, it's good to have this. You want to be able to run out of a house that's on fire, right? Um, you want to be able to, if something heavy is falling on someone, you want to be able to pick it up and uh, help that person. And with the bulking up of cortisol steroids rushing into the body with uh, uh, sympathetic activation, you're more likely to have that skillfulness. And what I think is important here is how, um, when people have chronic hyperarousal, when you're, um, getting stressed out in traffic, you know, when at the dry cleaners, at the market, when you have to stand in line and you're waiting and you're in a hurry, when you start to get tense and, you're, and you get in gear, um, you can have these little mini fight-flight responses and we all can do that and can be what we do in, in, in our industrial culture. But what happens with in, increasing um, reactivity when we're under stress is that we're always looking for that then. We don't have normal vigilance, we have heightened vigilance. And we can tend, in that case, if we're very, very hyper aroused, to have negative bias and attention and memory, and actually um, more negative mood states. So things get really tight. So if we're under stress and we're holding that in a small jar, you can, you know, the stress feels differently than if we're under stress and we're holding that in a larger jar. And the idea with mindfulness is that um, we're able to become more spacious psychologically and physiologically with mindfulness um, meditation practices. So here's a, another image with a collage from the Walkabout program. And so in the beginning of this program, people play with our art materials before they take photographs to see you know, what's, what is collage making about and how can I make meaning about my experience? What's next? Make every day count. Fearless survivor, you're not quite ready to be dead. Time to chill. Got it. So a message sent to the self by um, a young man in his 30s um, with um, a blood cancer. So here's the rest and repair response, and I might have mentioned, um, because they're predominantly women in this audience, um, though I want to give an acknowledgement to the gentlemen that are here, 
that um, with the fight flight, you know, it's not just fight and flight. For women, it can be tend and befriend. That when women are under stress and hyper aroused and worried, I think that they often can tend to circle those wagons and take on more caregiving. When they themselves are sick, you know, all of a sudden they're caring for a couple more neighbors that are also sick or taking on more responsibilities at church or with their grandchildren or with their children uh, as friends. And so it's, it's kind of important for women to look at how they're managing stress and if they're actually ending up with more to do when actually they need more time for themselves. But when we evoke the hard wiring in our body with the parasympathetic response, then what happens is it kind of opens up for us. It's easier for us to learn new things we have better attention and concentration and decision making, and um, it's the parasympathetic side of the nervous system is associated um, with a more positive mood. So in the mindfulness-based stress reduction training program, essentially there's this possibility that through meditation one can evoke this parasympathetic response in the body. And you don't, you know, you're ready to do that inside. You don't have to build that. It's there for you. The wiring may be a little rusty if you've been under a lot of stress, but um, that's wiring. We know that we can build new um, cells all the time, and uh, you know, there's a refreshment in the body. The body can repair itself, and using the parasympathetic, evoking the parasympathetic response, um, the practice of that, and of course, we call this meditation practice. Uh, helps with um, you getting really much more in touch with your capacity to calm yourself. It becomes really available, and a really available capacity. And isn't that a wonderful thing, that without uh, five glasses of wine, or one, whatever it would be, or any other kinds of method for calming yourself, that would be an external thing that you would take, that you would be able to actually develop the skills over time to uh, calm yourself and to be more comfortable negotiating the challenges of life. And I just want to end by talking about this, which is that I think the mindfulness skills training program is particularly useful. And again, I like it with art therapy because we're working with the sensory motor system and we're making pictures that we can objectively see. So we're taking the inner subjective experience and turning it out as an objective experience. And this is a little um, chart I've made of Leventhal's self-regulation theory. So it's not from his work, but I've tried to summarize it here for you. So the idea here is that the way we organize coping is a combination of holding um, our representation of a problem or a challenge, a representation of a health problem or a challenge, and um, then the subjective or emotional representation of a health problem or challenge. And so we're holding our objective cognitive experience and our subjective emotional experience, and we combine those to form a lens through which we perceive um, our situation. And so one reason this relates to art therapy is that um, we hold our experience in all sorts of representatives way, representative ways inside. We have mental representations of our experience and often they're in the form of images. And importantly, images are our first way of knowing the world. The way we hold things in pictures is our first way of knowing when we're children and then we develop language. So we actually are very, people are very skillful at making, using images to express their cognitive or objective understanding and their subjective experience and combine them to take a look at the lens from which they're perceiving. Um, so what can happen is if it's hev a heavily emotional view and it leaves out the facts, then you can see there would be bias, emotional bias, in how we're organizing our coping. But if it's a heavily cognitive view, and it's just the facts, and it leaves out our feeling experience, then again, it's, it's biased on the cognitive side. For to be whole persons, we want to take into consideration our subjective and objective experience and organize our coping uh, in consideration of both. So you may have heard this in prior presentations or know of the idea that there can be problem-focused problem, problem 
problem solving and emotion focused problem solving. And that those two domains of problem solving are important to solving problems. Both of them are important. And I would say there's mindfulness focused problem solving as well. So when we use mindfulness skills to um, take a look at the subjective experience and our objective experience, there's a lot more clarity in the lens through which we perceive and appraise our situation and organize our coping. And so, and we can do that by, again, bringing attention in at any moment. Uh, mindfulness skills help us with attention to awareness of our experience, both maybe the thoughts that are emotional, but also the thoughts that include the fa uh, facts and um, our physical experience in our body of how we hold our emotions, and we organize our coping more successfully, I believe. In art therapy, we think of sense data coming in, and that's organized through the per perceptual domain. So even if it's something we've heard, we can make an image of it, something we've smelled or tasted, and uh, of course, something we've seen. We hold those experiences, mental representations, and what happens is how we hold our experience mediates our response to stimulus. And in our therapy, what we do is we take a look at how we're holding our experience through imagery. And then we can make pictures that transform that and create new images to hold inside. So our therapy is very transformational in that it helps us take a look at where we are and bring in what else is there for us. Again, it's a bit more spacious. It creates more spaciousness in us and a deeper understanding relative to meaning making, which we spoke with about. I just wanted to show you a quick few slides and then we'll look at some collages from the Walkabout program. Um, I was a co-investigator and the interventionist on an NIH study that was funded by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at Thomas Jefferson between 2001 and 2003. And um, so we compared two groups of women diagnosed with cancer, um, about 50 in each group, 50 some in each group. Um, Women were randomly assigned, this was a randomized clinical trial in which women were randomly, randomly assigned to receive mindfulness-based art therapy, eight-week program, um, and, uh, or to have usual oncologic care. And uh, what we see here is that the, uh, the women on this uh, Symptoms Checklist 90, which is a psychological distress scale, um, had a five-fold increase a decrease in psychological distress as compared to the women just having usual oncologic care. So it's very significant that just with an eight week, two and a half hour meeting that um, these women who were age matched in this study um, had much more significant improvement in two months having uh, some mindfulness training and coming to make art around their skills training in mindfulness. So uh, Dr. Dan Monti at Jefferson was the principal investigator on this study. Another um, measure was with the SF36, and we see as well that the mental health of women compared to the women that were just having usual oncologic care was significantly increased and improved um, with the women that were in the mindfulness-based art therapy or MBAT group. And I thought what was really beautiful in this study was that the, the women in the MBAT program, as compared to the controls, actually had a significant increase in their general health over the two months of participating in a mindfulness-based art therapy program, as compared to the controls whose general health actually decreased slightly. So, so there's something here about being able to come into the skills training and mindfulness to develop attention and awareness, to learn to calm the mind and body, to be with the challenges in the body, um, as well as the comforts that may be there as well, because often when we're sick, we forgot, forget about our wellness. So mindfulness training helps us be with our illness experience as well as our wellness combined. So it's a wellness-focused program. So I brought some flyers today for Walkabout. This is a program that, again, was developed under funding from the Live Strong Foundation um, 
Center for Excellence here at uh, Penn Medicine at Abramson Cancer Center. And I uh, was able to be uh, participate in developing this program at Pennsylvania Hospital. I'm very lucky and have a great gratitude to Mary Pat Lynch and, and the uh, Live Strong team here at Penn Medicine that made that possible. And um, walkabout includes digital photography, actually walking outside, um, mindful walking, so it's very slow for about 40 minutes, um, maybe five of the eight sessions that we meet for two and a half hours. And it includes some skills training and mindfulness. So there's a meditation CD that people take home to learn to uh, do the mindfulness training. And then um, the, some of the pictures that people take are printed out. They get to choose what pictures they would like printed. And, um, and then they make collages. So this program, I'll tell you a little bit more about when it's starting again soon. So the idea here is that people have the skills training and the mindfulness, as I said, and there are a two and a half hour weekly meetings, and this program is held on Tuesdays from 4.30 to 7. And it's, we actually start by walking into Washington Square. I don't know if you know the John Carnell Cancer Center is in the old Farm Journal building on uh, Washington Square. So our first walkabout is in Washington Square. And there's uh, a tomb to the Revolutionary War soldiers, many of whom are buried below Washington Square. And uh, on it, um, it has a, a constant flame there. Uh, freedom is a light for which many men have died in darkness. Um, and many people take pictures of this eternal flame. It draws many people. Um, the mindful walkabout, beautifully, because it's mindful, we don't have any goal of getting anywhere or doing anything. We're just walking out quietly, and we go in a number of different directions from the hospital, and we just use the immediate environment to uh, practice attentional skills and bring the camera to uh, what touches us, both what touches us in terms of what we see that we like, or maybe a sound we hear that we can capture with an image. And also, uh, pictures are taken of what we don't like, what we're turning away from, what touches us in a negative way. So it's a kind of interesting, mindful exploration. We have a lot of beautiful tools and materials that are used with the photographs to make collages, and we have a mindful exploration of the art materials in the beginning of the group so people can start to learn about um, mindful, what mindfulness is. You know, So people use the art materials to begin. How does this feel in my hand? How does it touch the paper? What does it do? Um, do I, am I turning away from it? Do I not like it? Is it too messy, or does it not give me enough control? And, uh, wonderful mindfulness exercise. So here's a collage. So you can see the collage, think about meaning making and that natural human capacity and need for making meaning. That being human is about, human being is meaning making. And um, this is a collage that's built over time using some newspaper cutouts and magazine cutouts with art materials. And this um, young man in his 30s with cancer who had had a recurrence and was post-treatment made this image uh, called hard medicines. You can see the building process here. He said, I found the how to approach in the mindfulness meditation and practice very helpful and in that he was post-treatment and for his recurrence he said, you know, it's okay to feel okay. That's a really wonderful thing. It's okay to feel okay. Um, uh, definitely a transitional phase perhaps in from uh, active treatment to post-treatment. Here's another collage just made with general materials, which shows the image of a face and uses the art materials. It's very free form. People can do what they want. It, there's, uh, in, the art table is informal, and we make boundaries around the formal meditation practice. The simplicity of just a color field, black for this woman in active treatment for cancer, um, and then adding in some color and some liveliness. And again, the use of combined images here um, from photographs taken on the walkabout um, with some painted background. So there's a great playfulness in this. You know, we learn the world when we're young through primary play. And um, whether it's your garden or sewing or your wood shop or scrapbooking or clothes collecting or even sports, 
uh, whatever you do uh, that encourages your creativity is very healing. And uh, playfulness is a very important thing. It's related to mindfulness in terms of bringing direct attention to experience. And uh, Carl Rogers um, wrote about creativity saying um, that one thing about creativity is that it's the ability to play spontaneously. And we know that when you have a, an experience with cancer and treatment, that those things that uh, are usually the field of your endeavor and uh, play can often be lost to you. And uh, playing with art materials, just in a simple way, is a great way to initiate a reintroduction to play. Um, if you can't get out to your garden or to your sewing machine um, or um, out on the field where you do a sport. Sometimes people just take photographs and they manipulate them by adding um, lines and color on top, changing the scene. We might think of this as a transformational image. Um, the picture on the bottom right is, I think, of a water grate. Um, and that was in a grassy plain, and the person added in all sorts of origami papers to um, enliven that metal. Here's a poignant picture of um, a tree in Washington Square with a limb broken, kind of a metaphor. Um, the art therapy process includes not necessarily telling your story, um, you know, by the facts, but telling your story symbolically. So this person took this picture of a tree that had a broken limb and, um, and then brought it back in. And, and you can see just did the incredibly creative recreation of that tree um, with torn tissue and uh, glue. Very beautiful. So here are some pictures. I love this as a, a great way to talk about walkabout because people are asked to take images of what they're turning away from. And often we see that people are turning away from the trash in the park or on the street. And you know, it's really interesting to think about that because we might think that, you know, we think of the cancer cells as kind of trash inside of us. And um, here's someone who, uh, again, is struggling as a young person with a diagnosis of cancer and fairly regular treatment. And I so appreciated this shot of this cup that says gulp, because a cancer experience can cause a real gulp. And uh, I love the symbol of that, both by color, he's using it for the color, but also using it for the expression. Um, and uh, you see how playfully he's made meaning of all of this by taking those photographs and interweaving them. People work in uh, their own way. Everybody has their own language, the colors they like. You can see these are very, very, two very different images made by the same person. But um, those are kind of the colors that they like to work with a lot, it seems. And so building very different stories, making different meanings. One has a poem from Emily Dickinson, the one on the left. And the one on the right is built of pictures taken outside. And those numbers reflect decision-making around the number of years that could be predictive of cancer survivorship based on whether the person did an additional protocol for treatment. So here's the cancer stories in that picture on the right in terms of considering the benefits of various treatment options. If you think you can draw, or you don't have to, <laughs> in walkabout, we're working with uh, Freeman, beautiful materials and your own images you take. But you can see in these three images how a caregiver, a uh, young man engaged to a um, lovely young woman with cancer, um, started out on the far left uh, trying to figure out what is this art therapy business and how do I make images? And then started working with his images in the second picture. And by the third, you can see how he's discovered his language. And that's really what happens with adults. You know, often they start with image making, making art like they did their last year in school. And then slowly they come in to their own art language. And I think you can see the evolution of this person's art language right here. And I also think you can feel, to some extent perhaps, how fragmented the cancer experience is. Um, maybe that that's held in these images. 
you can see the original photographs on the left here, and then how the person is making meaning and um, being creative here on the right. Uh, something coming from inside out that can be objectively seen and spoken to. This um, woman has had also had a recurrence. She's in her 50s. And uh, she's starting out with using a lot of the art materials. She has been in art therapy before. And then finally, in the third picture, you can see themes here, this kind of massive overlaying, um, darkness and light and color. And on the far right, she's uh, focused in on a walkabout we did in the historic Pennsylvania hospital um, with an eye from a portrait of a renowned doctor from the founding of the hospital to the peephole in the door that goes into the original operating room on the third floor of that building where there are public tours. And finally, um, she makes this at the end. So, you know, it's really beautiful because there's an open door here, and she's in the open door. And I think we see here a shift at the end of this art making. She said once she got used to being in the clinical area at night, she was able to relax and have fun, and creativity was fine. So even when people are making images around the cancer experience, they're actually playing and having an enjoying time. It's a very sensory-based experience. I learned through the walkabout experience to be free of fear and to let go of anxiety, and then to be me, healthy and happy. And these are more images from another person in the group. Um, a young woman who had also had a recurrence. And um, I just wanted to say, you know, you can see very repeating themes here in these three images. She's working thematically with structures that are floating. Um, you know, is the tide rising or is it going out? You know, what's grounded, what's not? So you can see how someone could playfully work with feelings of anxiety or worry by um, being creative and working with images and also having the satisfaction of aesthetic beauty, just the aesthetic beauty of this image, these images, they're so beautiful. And finally, she said at the end of the program, the walkabout has taught me there are many different shades of my experience. It has given me a valuable tooth tool through mindfulness training, a way to find refuge inside myself, a safe place to go. It gave me the opportunity to create and learn about myself and feelings through art, and making the art gave me a feeling of joy. I was feeling adrift and lost, and now I have a way forward and feel much more calm and hopeful and joyful about myself. So um, I don't know how much time I have left. I think I've done this on time at least. And um, again, the walkabout program is, we're going to have a spring walkabout at Joan Carnell Cancer Center, which begins April 4th. And there are only 10 participants in the, each of these programs. And then the summer, summer walkabout begins on, sorry, June 6th. So um, if anyone here has an interest in walkabout, um, we have some flyers here for it. We are giving a preference to our patients at Joan Carnell Cancer Center. But, um, and this is program is open to anyone in current active treatment. People can tolerate it. It's um, uh, post-treatment, and it's open. To, uh, there are no age restrictions, 18 or older. Um, it's not for children. It's for adults, the young adults and um, older adults. And uh, caregivers are also welcome. So that's the presentation today. I hope you're inspired remembering that there is a, a program for cancer patients, a mindfulness program for cancer patients, which begins um, May 16th at, um, here at Penn Medicine. And you can go uh, taught by Gabriel Rocco, just a wonderful mindfulness teacher, um, pennmedicine.org backslash mindfulness. And then there's walkabout down at Joan Carnell. And uh, I don't know if there are time, there's time for questions. I think we may have used all the time, but 